Amen. Thank you. Welcome to Wednesday night. And time is really flying. Can you bring me down just a bit? I'm ringing up here. Uh, it's already Thanksgiving in another week or so, which brings me to a bit of business. We will not have a Wednesday night service next week. Uh, what we've been doing traditionally for the last several years is a combined service with uh, Lexington Prayers, uh, First Baptist of Lexington and Round Hill Baptist. And so we're going to be meeting at Round Hill Baptist, which is down the road here. You don't make the bend going left. You go straight as if you're going to Persimmons Grove. And then a little bit past there, Round Hill Baptist. And we're going to be meeting there Tuesday, not Wednesday, Tuesday at 7 o'clock. So put that on your calendar and make sure that you tell, you know, family, friends who are not here tonight. But we, I'm sure we'll be announcing it again on, on Sunday. So that's what we'll be doing. And then there's one other announcement that's Thanksgiving related. You know, ever since I came out here, which was in 2001, we've always had a traditional U Turn for Christ Thanksgiving Day dinner. And over the years, uh, the spread has gotten bigger and the people have got, gotten a bunch uh, and uh, people come away fat as ticks and it's good eating and fried turkey and all that good stuff. So we're going to be doing that again this um, Thanksgiving Day at 12 o'clock. We set it at 12 so that people who want to be with family can do that. Man, man, please come out and just join us. And what we ask is that you bring a dish, a side dish that feeds at least 15 people. You know, by the way, it wouldn't hurt if you brought Pastor C some chocolate chip pecan cookies either. <laughs> Just kidding. I need that like I need four holes in my head. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel. We're going to be in chapter 9. But there's a couple of references that I want to bring to us before we get into the, to the teaching. The anointing of Saul is the title of the message. And what we're going to do is we're going to end up seeing... God using Samuel to anoint uh, the first king of Israel. No, no um, insignificant, if you will, event, I must say. The first king of Israel, and, and as we go through it, it'll be interesting to see um, just how that all comes to fruition. But before we do that, go to chapter 8 and look at verse 7, because it was the people who were asking for a king. And Samuel got a bit upset, right? He wasn't too cool with that. The Lord spoke to him and said, Samuel, don't worry about it. They haven't rejected you. They rejected who? And what they were saying is, we, don't, we want a king over us to judge us. We want to be like the other nations. We want to see how this thing is working for the people that have chosen or have a king over them. So they went the way of the world. But in verse 7 of chapter 8, um, it talks about <clears throat> the people seeing the nations and the people wanting to be ruled by a king. The interesting part about that is, is that the king that the Lord chooses, well, let's, let's take a look. Let's jump into 1 Samuel chapter 9. Verse 1, it says, Now there was a man of Benjamin, whose name is Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zor, the son of Bekorath, the son of Aphia, the son of a Benjamite, a mighty man of valor. Verse 2 says, He had a son whose name was Saul. By the way, Saul, the root word of Saul in the Hebrew means ass. And remember, the people asked. God for a king. Interesting play on words, if you will. Saul, a choice and handsome man, and there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. From his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. Tall, striking, if you will, a, a Fabio of the Old Testament. Tall, dark, and handsome. And I thought about that because there are other instances in, in the scriptures where the Lord speaks of the appearance of a man. You know, uh, David wasn't a, a, a bad looker. He was ruddy and, and handsome. 
but that's the only thing that distinguishes Saul, is that he looks good. He's a good-looking guy. Good-looking guy. But notice he talks about, uh, in the scriptures, about Saul's dad, Kish, being a mighty man of valor, which means that he was a man of wealth and influence. And that word, or that phrase, mighty man of valor, had some military connotations too. So obviously he was pretty, pretty tough guy in terms of battle. So he comes from a good stock, a good lineage, but there's nothing that separates Saul other than, man, he's a good looker. Some of you ladies might have said he was a babe. Well, I guess you guys don't say that anymore, huh? That's old and antiquated, huh? So this is the people, I'm sorry, this is the man that God chose. And I thought about that. It's like, okay, what significance does that have? This being the first king, and this is the person that God chose. Because remember later on, after Saul is rejected, and God raises up David, and Samuel goes to anoint David, and he's looking for David, but David's out in the, uh, the pasture guarding the sheep and taking care of the sheep and tending the sheep. And he comes upon David's brothers, and he looks at one of them, and the Lord says, don't look at his what? His appearance, right? Because man is mindful of, uh, of the outward appearance, but God sees the what? The heart. But yet he chooses a man that is handsome and, and head and shoulders above others. And again, I was thinking about that, and I just kind of to myself figured that maybe this was so that the people would receive Saul. God's ways are not our ways. And what God sees, we don't see. And it's very difficult to see a heart of a man. Many times all we can do is go by what? What we see on the outside. So that the people would possibly not reject. And later on, as, as we continue in, and I believe it's in the next chapter, chapter 10, when, when Saul is uh, presented before the people, there's this, ah, and people get excited. But God already made provision for this way back in Deuteronomy chapter 17. And I spoke about this when I first started teaching in, in Samuel. Please go there. Deuteronomy 17, verse 14. You see, it's not that the people wanted a king. That wasn't the problem. That wasn't, you know, the determining factor that caused God to be, you know, upset or angry with his people. Because God in Deuteronomy made provision for when the people decided to choose a king. It's just that they wanted to be like the other nations. They wanted to be like the other people. But God has chosen us to be what? Set apart. We are his unique people. We're not supposed to be like what? The other people. We're supposed to be separated, right? And so because they wanted the king to rule over them, and the Lord knew that, but this is the, the provision that God provided for that. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 17, he says, When you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, and you possess it and live in it, <clears throat> and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me, you shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses one from among your countrymen. You shall set as king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he will not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. 17, he shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away. Nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. All of those things that he said the king shall not do, guess what? They all did. Not only Saul, but all the kings that followed after him. Multiplied horses, wives, gold, and even some of them returned to Egypt to make covenant with pharaohs. And so all these things that God is saying that the kings are not supposed to do, they ended up doing. Then he goes on to say, now shall be about when, come about when he sits down, verse 18, on the throne of his kingdom, 
he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priest. It shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God. Be careful observing all the words of this law and these statutes. So it was okay to have a king, but the king needed to be a man after God's own heart. The king needed to be governed by his relationship and his worship of God Almighty. And through that relationship, the king would lead the people. See that? So it's not so much that they wanted a king. It's just that they wanted a king to lead on his own. But, but God said that, okay, when you choose a king, make sure that first of all, he has my word and that he observes it and that he lives by it, that he worships me, and that through that worship of me, he can lead and govern your people. How I many you guys know that that's how we're supposed to do it today? Because we're called to be high priests well, of the royal priesthood, Peter says, he wrote. And we're to be governed by God. And our relationship with God is supposed to direct how we live our lives. Pastor John said this yesterday, and he says it all the time. Ministry, if you're called, flows out of your relationship with the Lord. But you know what? Just living life flows out of your relationship with the Lord, amen? It's not just ministry. It's how we live our lives. Because through that relationship and abiding in Christ, if you abide in me and my word in you, you'll bear what? Much fruit. So he was, the, the king was called to observe uh, and be careful to observe the words of God. And 20, it says that his heart may not be lifted up above his countrymen, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right or to the left, so that he and his sons may continue long in his kingdom in the midst of Israel. In verse 20, it says, not only is it strategic, special, important that the king observe, read my word, so that he can lead you guys, but so that he can remain what? Humble. That his heart not, not be lifted up. God's word has a way of doing that, right? God's word has a way of humbling us and keeping us on an even plane. Because it's real easy for me to get puffed up when I look out at you guys, because you guys, man, you guys are messed up. Y'all got some issues. It's real easy for me to do that. But when I look to the one who's perfect, I'm like Isaiah, right? In chapter 6, he said what? Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So the word of God keeps us on that even, steady kill of being humble before God. And so it's not just important for the king. It's important for all of us. It's important for all of us. The king was supposed to be governed by his relationship and worship of God again. Tonight we will see the man that God chooses to be the first king over Israel. We will see the introduction, the advent, the arrival of the monarchy of the nation of Israel, of God's people. And we will see also a picture, and this is really cool. Um, in the Bible, particularly in the Old Testament, all is a depiction, a picture of, of who? The Holy Spirit. And when, when Saul gets anointed with oil, it's a picture of, of God using Samuel to pour out the Holy Spirit upon Saul. So we'll get to see Saul anointed, which literally means to be, to be rubbed with oil, or to be smeared. And there's one other person who proclaimed that. See, anointing has, in this particular context, two different meanings. It means to be consecrated, set apart, which is what that whole symbolic thing of being anointed with the oil was. But it also has uh, the connotation of being filled with the Spirit. Go to uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Luke 4, verse 18. <clears throat> and this is when the Lord grabbed the um, scroll and was standing in the temple, began to proclaim. And this verse was taken from Isaiah 61. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me, there's that word, to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed. He anointed me to preach. He consecrated me. He set me apart to proclaim 
the gospel. Now go to Acts chapter 10, verse 38. And this is not Jesus speaking, but this is being spoken of him. Acts 10, 38. You know of, Je uh, of Jesus of Nazareth, how God, what? Anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. The Spirit of God fills us and sets us apart, or sets us apart and fills us. And so in those, in those two verses, it talks about uh, being anointed, being set apart, being consecrated, and then being anointed or being filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's the picture that we're going to see as God uses Samuel to anoint Saul. Because God called him. And when you're called by God, you most certainly have to be anointed by God. Now, going back. 1 Samuel chapter 3. I'm sorry, um, chapter 9, verse 3. <clears throat> now the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to his son, Saul, take now with you one of the servants and arise. Go search the don for the donkeys. He passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalish, uh, but they did not find them. Then they passed through the land of Shalem, but they were not there. Then he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but he did not find them. So he left Benjamin, the land of Benjamin, goes up north a little bit and then doubles back and comes back through Benjamin. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant, who was with him, come, let us return, or else my father will cease to be concerned about the donkeys and will become anxious for us. He said to him, behold now, this is the, the slave, the servant, there is a man of God, speaking of Saul, in the city, I'm sorry, speaking of Samuel, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there, perhaps he will tell us about our journey on which we have set out. Seven, then Saul said to the servant, but behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is gone from our sack, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What shall we do? The servant answered Saul again and said, behold, I have in my hand a fourth of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God, and he will turn, uh, I'm sorry, he will tell us our way. Verse 9, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he used to say, come and let us go to the seer, for he who was called a prophet now was formerly called a seer. And in verse 10, then Saul said to his servant, well said, let us go. So they went to the city, and the city was Ramah, where the man of God was. So this is God's hand. He's using the donkeys to direct and guide Samuel, I'm sorry, Saul to Samuel, the lost donkeys. And so God is at work behind the scenes orchestrating this. The donkeys get lost. Saul takes a servant commanded by his father to go find the donkeys. And we see the hand of God, his providence working in that. But not only do the donkeys lead Saul to Samuel, look at what his, his servant says. His servant says, behold, in verse 6, now there is a man of God in this city, and the man is held in honor. All that he says surely comes true. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us about our journey on which we have set out. So not only is he using donkeys to, to bring Saul to Samuel, he's using someone else. And doesn't that, that happen sometimes with the Lord? That he'll use circumstances, he'll use situations, he'll use people to get us in line with his will. Saul was ready to give up and go. He was reluctant. But not only that, he says, but we don't have anything to take with us. 
What shall we bring? We don't have any food because that was a tradition back then. When you showed up to a man of God to hear him speak to you, you usually brought a present. Sometimes it was a very ostentatious present. Sometimes it's something very small, but it was something that was done out of sincerity. And Saul was very reluctant. How many of us know God wants us just to come as we are, right? Somebody should say amen up in there. I'm glad. Because when I came to him, I was toe up from the flow up. You see, God doesn't, I mean, we don't have to come to God when we got it all together. Because you know what? We'll never have it all together. Amen? Amen? God wants us to come to him just as we are. And sometimes we are reluctant. Well, I don't have anything to bring God. Newsflash. If you had all the money in the world and every toy, every possession that you thought you ever could have, you still don't have enough to bring to God. Because you know why? All he wants is our worship. Just bring your worship. Just come and worship. Come and fellowship with me. Come and hang out with me. So it's never going to be a time in our lives when we got something to bring God. So just come. There's a song, Come As You Are, one of my favorite old, old um, classic song, Come As You Are. Just come as you are. So he has this friend, this servant that says, come, let us go and see about this man. Another thing. You remember in the end of uh, Saul's reign, um, he was um, really being troubled by an evil spirit. He ended up going to a, uh, a woman that was practicing divination and he was inquiring about things, and he was seeking things that he shouldn't have. In the beginning of his ministry, he goes to a man of God. At the end of his ministry, he's inquiring from someone who has nothing to do with God. I thought that was an interesting contrast. And for me, what that meant was Saul started out, man, doing what was right. But in the end, in the end, what happened? He lost his way. It's not how we start, family. That's how we what? Finish. The, the theme of our pig roast this year was finish well. And the reason why the Lord laid that on my heart is because in the years that I've been doing U-Turn for Christ, and I've been with U-Turn for 15 years, I've seen a whole bunch of guys start well. A whole bunch. Like hundreds, if not thousands. But it doesn't always end up well. This walk with Christ is, is depicted as a, not a sprint, uh, not a dash. It's a, a marathon. It's one that we have to labor to do each and every day. So it's not about how we start. It's about how we finish. And God wants us to, to finish well. And I don't want to beat Saul up in the, the commentary that I was reading today, one of the commentators were talking about a lot of scholars really beat up on, on Saul, you know, because of the things that he did and, and how he ended up. And, and I don't want to do it because in the beginning, he started out well. He delivered the people uh, of Israel from, from the Philistines, and he did some good things. He just kind of lost his way. I'm going on in verse 10. Sorry, verse 11. As they went up the slope to the city, they found young women going out to draw water and said to them, Is the seer here? Seer prophet. Formerly known as seer, now prophet. That word seer literally mean, means one who sees. Prophet was one called by God to be God's spokesman. That's an interesting combination. One who sees. Saul was going to see someone who could see, but not only see, see spiritual things, but he was going to one who could also speak for God. And again, that's a word for us. If you want to know what's going on in your life, if you want to know what's, what's going to happen in the future, if you want to hear from God, you go to his what? His word. Because his word it tells. We're living in times where as crazy as it is, it's pretty cool because we're able to see prophecy being fulfilled before our very eyes from the Word of God. God said it was going to be like this. 
didn't he? He said it was going to get crazy. Not in those words, but that's what he said when he walked this earth. It's going to be birth pains. This world's going to wax cold. And the love, the natural affinity for man is going to wane. And we're seeing that. And leaders have not a clue. And pray for our president. Pray for our president and all those who are in authority. Because at the end of the day, God's the only one that can rescue, not man. So they're going to see the seer. Verse 12, they answered him. Uh, I'm sorry, they answered, yeah, they answered them and said, he is, uh, he is. See, he is ahead of you. Hurry now, for he has come into the city, for the people have a sacrifice on the high place today. Samuel was back in his, in his uh, hometown, and, and he was there to do what he usually does, and that was offer, offer up sacrifices and pray over the sacrifice and bless it. High place, high place, high place. In the Old Testament, it speaks many times about uh, the nation of, of Israel going to high places and, and offering up sacrifices. But the connotation of it was what the Canaanites and, and the, uh, the people that were in the land that the Israelites came into did to offer up sacrifices to idols. But that was when the temple was built. The temple had not been built yet. And so many times they would go up to these high places, which just meant that it was a little bit above, elevated, and then they would offer up sacrifices. Saul would not be involved in any idol worship. So this was a legitimate sacrifice before the Lord. Soon, verse uh, 13, as soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he comes because he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited will eat. Now, therefore, go up for you will find him at once. So they went up to the city. As they came into the city, behold, Samuel was coming out toward them to go to the high place. So Saul was going to seek counsel. Please turn to Proverbs chapter 24. There's a book that was recommended uh, to the leadership of U-Turn for Christ several years ago when I went out to California and then to Mexico for, for our leadership conference that we have annually. And it's called How to Counsel God's Way. And it was written by a pastor who's since gone on to be with the Lord, Bob Hulkstra. He was a Calvary Chapel pastor. Um, you don't have to be a counselor to utilize it, but it's a great read. How to Counsel God's Way. There are many people who hang shingles outside their office and say they are Christian counselors. Be careful. Be very careful. Because in this day and age, many Christians are mixing man's wisdom with the word of God. How many of us know that that mixture doesn't work? It doesn't work. It's God's way and God's way only. And over the years, many people have called U-Turn for Christ and say, well, what do you guys do? Well, we instruct them in the word of God. Well, how does that work? Don't you guys have counselors? Yeah, we, the word of God. No, I mean, do you guys sit down and, and counsel them? Yeah, the word of God. No, I'm talking about counseling. You know, do you guys get into, you know, drug addiction and all that stuff? Yeah, we do. The word of God. The word of God. That's the only counsel that's going to help. Proverbs 24, 6, it says, for by wise guidance you will wage war, and in abundance of counsel there is what? Victory. Turn back to Proverbs eleven fourteen. Where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in the abundance of counselors there is what? See, if we want to have victory in our lives, if we want to overcome, if we want to be successful in this life, that is doing everything it can to bring us down. This world is not our, our home. There is nothing about the world 
that pleases God, but many of us go to it to find um, comfort, to find solace, but the world's not our friend. So the way we overcome, the way we have victory, the way we walk victoriously in this world is through the counsel of God's word. And I don't know about you ladies, but us guys have a difficult time going to another man asking, what, you know, can you help me? You know, what should I do in this situation? But there's nothing wrong with that. Because it says in the multitude of counsel, man, there is victory. And so Saul went to go seek the counsel of the seer, the one who knows. Verse 15. Now a day before Saul's coming, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, saying, About this time I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you will anoint him to be prince over my people Israel, and he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have regarded uh, my people because their cry has come to me. 17, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall rule over my people. Then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Please, tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. In the morning I will let you go and tell you all that is on your mind. As for the donkeys which, you were, uh, which were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and all your father's household? God called Saul to be king. And God spoke this to Samuel. Told him that he was going to be there told him what to do. And so in studying this, and I shared this with a couple of people today, what that spoke to me about is God's calling, first of all, is specific. There have been many people that have come to me and said, I, I believe God's calling me to this. Well, what's he calling you to do? I don't know, but, but I think he's calling me to this. I'm not saying that that's not God, but, but here in this scripture, God's calling is specific. Look at what he says. He says, I will send you, uh, in verse 16, a man from the land of Benjamin, uh, and you shall anoint him to be what? To be prince over my people, Israel. And he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. You see that specific calling? He's going to be prince. He gives him the title and what he's going to do. But he also says, and this is what he's going to do. This is what I want him to do. And so that's a word for somebody out in the audience. I know it is. Because I had a conversation with him. God's calling is specific. And when God calls us to something, he gives us the idea of what he wants us to do. Now, he may not tell us in the beginning, because remember when he told uh, Abram to leave his countrymen and his family and all that, it said that God called him to what? A land that he did not know. He didn't know where he was going. So that we don't always know where God is sending us, but we certainly will know specifically what God is calling us to do. God's calling was specific. Verse 21. Saul replied, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel? And my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, why then do you speak to me in this way? This was in reference to what Samuel said to him in verse 20. What Samuel was saying is, is that what was the, 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 the nation of Israel desiring? They were desiring what? A king. And so Saul knew that that's what Samuel was saying to him. But notice the, the humility in, in Saul's answer to Sam. He was like, yeah, that's right, man. You guys got a winner with me, man. I'll lead this, this people, man, and I'll, I'll be that. It's like, wait a minute. 
You're picking me? First of all, from the smallest tribe out of all the 12 tribes. And, and out of all the 12 tribes, in the, the least of the tribes, we're the least of the, the clans. Why would you pick me? Why would God pick him? So that when it all went right, God would receive the what? The glory. It takes the foolish things to confound the wise, the weak over the strong, because that's how God operates. And I thank God for that. Because I'm, he's used me for 15 years. And it's not because of me. You know that. It's because of the God in me. Praise the Lord for that. Because I'm not above getting all puffed up. But he has a way of bringing me down. Because just when I think I nailed it. And I came up with that great, that great message. That all pastors think they get. And then afterwards somebody says, yeah, old man, but, but what about this? And irrespective of all the, the platitudes and out of boys, not that we do it for that, it's like, man, you go home like, man. But in the end, all the glory goes to the Lord. Because it's God and not me. And in using me, I can look back and where my life was, and now he's brought me from where I was to where I'm at today, and God gets all the glory. So, Saul recognized that. He's humble before the Lord. He said, you're picking me? The least of the clan out of the smallest tribe. Because God wanted to use him. He was chosen by God. Then Samuel, verse 22 says, took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who were invited, who were about 30 men. Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion that I gave you concerning which I had said to you. Set it aside. Then the cook took up the, big, uh, took up the leg with which uh, it was on it and set it before Saul. Samuel said, here is what has been reserved. Set it before you and eat because it has been kept for you until the appointed time since I said I have invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. So God's calling is specific, but God's calling is also special. When he sat Saul, when Samuel sat Saul and his servant at the head of the table and then brought out that leg that was for him, that was, that was a sign of, of honor, of Saul being special. God's call is specific, but it's also special. I can't count the number of times that I've been blown away by the goodness of God in my life to allow me to do the things that he's allowed me to do over the last 15 years of my life, to take someone who was steeped in, in idolatry and in addiction from the streets, the mean streets of South Central Los Angeles, and allow me to travel to the Philippines, to travel to Trinidad and Tobago, to travel to Costa Rica. Special. And I don't take it for granted. A special calling. God's calling is not only specific, it's special. So when times get tough, and times get difficult, and they do in ministry. And anyone who's in ministry, part-time or full-time in here can say amen to that. When times get tough, God appoints us situations in our lives where we can sense his presence, but also know that even though it's difficult, it's still a special calling. And I think that happened for me in the first few months of what God called me to do when I was assisting as an assistant overseer in the ministry of U-Turn for Christ. And I've shared this before, so bear with me, but I think it's worth repeating, that there was this young man who was in phase one who was about to receive a certificate of completion. And in California, we do it on Friday nights because that's the Friday night you turn for Christ service. And so his family is there uh, to witness that, and so before the service, he brings his siblings and his mom up to me, and his mom has got this homemade loaf of um, zucchini bread, and she hands it to me. And I say, thank you. And then she reaches up and just gives me a hug that almost strangles me. And I'm like, wow, what's that for? 
She said, I just want to say thank you to the man that my son used to send me letters and write about. He used to always write about this man named Stephen. But he never told me that, and I never knew that. And I may have had maybe one or two conversations with that young man the whole time he was there because in the ranch in, in California, there could be anywhere from 50 to 60 to 70 guys at one time. You know, it's a pretty good-sized ranch. And what that did for me is that God allowed me to, to have that experience to recognize that even when I don't think I matter, I do. You understand what I mean? Even when I don't think I touch somebody's life, I do. Because there were many nights at that ranch in California, and even when I came here, and still some nights tonight where I weep because it gets hard. And I've wept. But God always brings me back to that, that special sense that, man, thank you, Lord. You allow me to do this. And Pastor John pays me, too, so that's cool, too. <laughs> it's a great gig. I got a friend in, in, in New Jersey, Pastor Kevin Hayter, says, man, where are you going to get a better deal? We get to do this. We get to serve the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, God Almighty, and then we get to go spend eternity with him. Where are you going to get a better deal than that? It's the greatest gig I could ever have. This is the greatest gig on earth, to serve the Lord, to serve him. Hmm. So God's calling is specific. And especially, but notice also, God's a God of timing too. Look at what it says in 24. It says, set it before you and eat because it has been kept for you until the what? Appointed time. See, sometimes we get ahead of God too, right? Man, I know God called me to this. Let's do this. And we go out before God has really called us to it because he's not only a God uh, of, of uh, service, but he's also a God of timing too. And sometimes we get ahead of God. At the appointed time. Who's appointed time? Who's appointed time? Not mine. At God's appointed time. And we need to be mindful of that. That God's going to call us, but it's in his time. And I've got a few friends, and I might be one of them too, that sometimes get very impatient because God is not in time. He's outside of time and one day is a thousand and a thousand is one day. So he's not looking at his watch like this saying, man, I need to get, I need to get going because if I don't, man, time's going to run out. He's not concerned about time like we are. So we need to wait on God. God's calling is specific, it's special, but it's also a, a time element that's involved. God's timing is perfect because it's his appointed time. Verse 25. When they came down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke with Saul on the roof, and they arose early. And at daybreak, Samuel called to Saul on the roof, saying, Get up, that I may send you away. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went into the street. And they were going down to the edge of the city. Samuel said to Saul, Say to the servant that he might go ahead uh, of us and pass on. But you remain standing now that I may proclaim the word of God to you. There are times when God just wants to speak to us and us alone. And it's not for anybody else but for who? And sometimes those are some of the greatest revelations that God revealed. And you can't wait till you go into the office or you see a friend to tell. But God is saying, no, this is just for you. I got a word for you. I want to speak into your life. And I was listening to a, um, um, a, a worship leader, a female. And she was talking about how, you know, she wrote a lot of her songs, the originals. And how God gave her specific songs for, for specific times. And the songs that he gave her that were to be sung before uh, people were, were decent songs. But he would give her songs that she would write, but she never, ever shared them or played them before people. I thought that was interesting. And you know what she said about those songs? Those are usually the what? The best. 
Those are usually the best songs. Now, can you imagine being a songwriter and God gives you this great song and he's saying, no, that's just for you and me. But God, let me know that's just for you and me. And sometimes the greatest moments that we have with God are special. And he just wants that moment with you. You guys understand what I mean by that? Just with me. Not to be shared with anybody else, but that intimacy that can only come between you and he, and he and you. That's the kind of God we have. That's the kind of God we serve. And it's that kind of love that draws us to him because he wants to spend that special time with us. And finally, in closing, this is what I want to share with you. Go to Galatians chapter 3. And we'll look at verse 1 through 5. Saul started out, he's anointed. I'm sorry, before you go there, let me finish up in in 10 verse 1. Then Saul took the flask of oil, poured it on his head, kissed him, and said, has not the Lord anointed you a ruler over his inheritance? Anointed. Has not God consecrated, set, uh, set you apart to be um, the ruler of his people? Now go to Galatians 3. And see, again, the, the pouring of the oil was a, a symbolic uh, symbol of God consecrating, God calling a man to a, a service, but it's also a picture of the Spirit of God being poured out and the idea is that Saul was to lead in the power of who? Of God. Not by power, not by might. Zechariah 4, 6 says, but by what? By my spirit. By my spirit. So he starts out in the spirit. And he does well. And in the first several verses that we get into Saul's uh, um, reign, he starts off and there's an increase in Saul's kingdom. But toward the end, we'll see a decline. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, it says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Christ, Jesus Christ, was publicly uh, portrayed as crucified, too. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with uh, with uh, with faith? Three, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then, does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do about works of the law or by hearing with faith? The context of this, Paul writing to the church in Galatians, he was dealing with Judaizers and the people in Galatia and other parts of of the church were trying to, to perfect what the Spirit had begun in them by thinking that they had to include works along with their faith in Jesus Christ. And so um, Paul is saying, having begun what? In the Spirit. How did you come to Christ? Did you come to Christ by doing works? Or was it by the Spirit of God through faith and believing and hearing in His Word? And there's many a work that started out in the Spirit, in the Spirit of God. Many works. But somehow along the way, they lose their way. And it begins to be a work of the flesh. Amen? There's no good thing in my flesh. And so that was begun in the spirit. How did you come to the Lord? How did you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior? By the work of the law or by the work of the spirit? The work of the spirit. And so having begun in the spirit... The only way that it's going to be perfected is by the Spirit, through the Spirit. And that's the final word tonight, family. The only way for God to perfect the work in me is by His Spirit. There's nothing in and of myself that I can do. There's no power in me that can change me. I love Pastor John's message this past Sunday was a great message, man. The whole idea of being consecrated, set apart, is so that at the end we look like who? Like me? If we look like me, we're in trouble. To look like who? Look like Jesus. 
And I can't make me look like Jesus. That's a work of what? The Spirit of God. It's work of the Spirit of God. And while he was telling the whole idea of, you know, as couples stay together, they begin to look like one another. I've seen couples that have dogs a long time or animals. They start looking like the animals. For real. And so the idea is, man, if I spend more time with the Lord, hanging out with him, then guess who I get, get to look like? I get to look like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I get to look like him, being conformed more and more into his image. So that work that God begun in each and every one of us, it was begun by the Spirit of God. Let us allow the Spirit of God to perfect it and work in us. And know this, that work is not always easy, and sometimes it's painful. Like the potter that, that needs the, the clay on the wheel, sometimes you want to jump off that potter's wheel because that's painful. Or that husbandman that has to prune the vine because in pruning it, it bears more fruit. That pruning is painful. Or being stuck in the crux of the bowl and having a mortar pound us to dust. It's painful. But in the end, it's a vessel of, of honor and glory for who? For the Lord God Almighty. So allow the work of the Spirit to continue. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you are a God who, as you begun that work in us, you're, you're faithful to complete it to the day of Christ Jesus. We are continually under construction. But also, Lord God, we thank you, and it amazes and astounds me, God, that you would call us for the work of service, for kingdom work, Lord, for, for work that's eternal. Lord, you could have called angels and used angels, but you chose to you, man, these earthen vessels, to do your will. May we realize the importance of that, Lord. May we recognize the special calling, Lord, and may we understand the specific calling. And may we also be in time with whatever your will is. And so, Lord, as we move into <clears throat> the time where Many of us begin to consider the holidays, Thanksgiving coming up, and then after that, uh, your birthday as we celebrate, Lord God, your birth. May we look back, Lord God, to all that you've done and all that you are. Just be so eternally grateful to know that you are God. Lord, as we live in a world today that's getting more and more chaotic, the craziness in Paris and all that continues to go on even though the news doesn't always talk about it because it's an everyday occurrence in, in the Middle East and in Syria and in Iraq and even our allies, our neighbors, your chosen people, the nation Israel. You know, we never ever forget, God, that you're in control and you're sovereign. And all that we see is only a sign of your coming, your second coming back. And, Lord, we look forward to that. Maranatha, Lord Jesus, come quickly. So, Father, as we enter into worship now, Lord, we just pray that you would bless. Bless our time. Bless your word, Lord. May it find fertile ground. May it take root, Lord, that it would change us. Pray these things in the precious name of our Lord, our God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat>